Well, we're going to take you through an ordeal that few people ever survive. The man whose story we bring you now is one of the lucky ones. For 15 hours, his fate was uncertain as he lay immobilized, the life slowly being crushed out of his body. His rescue was dramatic, as you'll see. But as Deborah Roberts discovered, that was only the beginning of his inspiring story. Imagine being at the bottom of this shaft, 20 feet down, trapped under thousands of pounds of earth. You can hear people frantically trying to reach you, but you can't see a thing and you can't move. You're cold, wet, and your body is being crushed under a weight as heavy as a Mack truck. You are buried alive. That unimaginable nightmare happened to this man, 26-year-old Darby Patrick, and he survived. It's a story of incredible luck, tremendous skill, and personal courage. It was painful down there, cold, wet, miserable there. I knew he'd 20 for the dirt. You know why you gonna get out of that? I thought it was dead. His amazing battle against death began last December 14th along this quiet stretch of highway in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was one in the afternoon and he was laying sewer pipe with his construction crew in a deep trench like this one, when suddenly, without warning, the dirt walls caved in on top of him. Down with one. A man buried on Highway 58. My back was only turned from him a second. And when I turned back around, door was covered up. I knew you had about three or four minutes to make it if you were buried uh, four foot deep from your chest down. And I didn't think there was going to be no hope at all. Darby was trapped near the bottom of the trench almost 20 feet down, stuck with his arms outstretched and his legs pulled apart. He should have suffocated within minutes. But amazingly, he was still breathing. That's because he was pinned with his face right next to the open end of the pipe he'd been installing and was getting air. He began screaming for help. I said I knew I was still there, still alive there. Could you feel anything at all, Darby? Not at first. I was just par paralyzed. I mean, I couldn't move nothing at all. And that's what's the scariest part right there. And I knew the only chance he had of survival was me digging out, digging dirt off of him. So I dug a lot of dirt off Darby. Philip Wills, Darby's boss and best friend, was frantic. He knew that as the seconds ticked away, so did Darby's chances for survival. Using a backhoe like this one, Wills desperately began scooping the soil out of the trench, but he stopped when he saw something that frightened him. One of the other boys lost his hard hat in the ditch, and when I pulled his hard hat up, I thought it was Darby's. Because see, you risk the danger of cutting somebody's head off when you take the dirt off of it. Paramedic Danny Haig was on the scene within minutes. He quickly learned that the victim he was coming to help was buried under five feet of earth and had now grown silent. We were beginning to wonder whether or not it was actually a rescue or a recovery. And you were thinking that it was going to be a, a recovery of a body at that time? Yeah, after that long period of time without hearing anything, we figured it would be in a recovery before it was over with. Above ground, they were about to give up hope when somehow Darby found the strength to shout for help again. The fight to save him continued. By 5 o'clock, it was already dark, and the temperature began dropping. Just let him come around over here on this side. Dozens of rescue workers poured in from all over Tennessee and Georgia. On the sidelines, Darby's wife of two years, Julie, waited anxiously, clinging to hope. That was the hardest part, not knowing what was going to happen. It was a desperate race against time, carried out in slow motion. Rescuers dug gingerly with hand shovels and hauled dirt and rock to the surface, bucket by bucket. They used a high-pressure air chisel and eventually brought in a giant vacuum truck to help with the excavation. It was dangerous for all involved. Everybody okay down there? To prevent a second cave-in, rescuers built a wooden support structure to protect them and Darby in the unstable trench. They had to dig for a while and then shore down to where they're digging. Oh. Dig some more, shore down to where they're digging. Some things just cannot go fast in this type of situation with safety. Dr. Jim Creel, an emergency specialist, was the first doctor on the scene. When I got there, I could look through the hole and see this man's scalp. And uh, I talked to him at that time. 
How surprised were you that he was talking and alert? I was quite frankly surprised uh, seeing the amount of dirt that was covering him. At 7.30, six hours into the rescue attempt, Darby's face and one arm were partially exposed, but the rest of his body was still pinned. Dr. David Horton was sent into the trench to help, but he thought Darby had little chance of making it. I just had never been involved in anything that had uh, gone on for three or four hours where somebody was completely covered up uh, and they had survived. Dr. Horton, seen here in the purple jacket, knew Darby was now in danger of dying from hypothermia, the loss of body heat, especially as the temperature dipped to 30 degrees. So he started him on heated IV fluid and oxygen, keeping him warm and medicated. He didn't have good feeling in his legs, but other areas he was having a significant amount of pain to where we were giving him frequent doses of morphine. The painstaking rescue effort continued hour after hour into the early morning. By now, 150 rescuers were focusing on saving one man. Paramedic Danny Haig risked his own life in the trench, trying to keep Darby's hopes up. I spent several hours laying there on the bottom of the trench face to face holding his hand. He was surprisingly upbeat, um, in good spirits the whole time he was down there. One, two, three, At 4.45 a.m., success. Everybody out. After nearly 16 hours of terror and pain, Darby was finally free and raised from the trench. Stop! I can remember a lot of people hollering. You got the O2 tank? You could hear the cheering? Yes, but being out once, they put me in an ambulance and I don't remember nothing until about two months later. When you could see him being freed, what did you think? Thank God. You know, I just figured he'd come out and nothing wrong with him because he was just joking and laughing and carrying on. But when they got him out, and that's when, it, you know, things got kind of, you know, for the worst. In fact, as an ambulance rushed Darby to a helicopter, doctors knew something that onlookers did not. Darby was probably going to die. The very act of freeing him from the trench and releasing the crushing pressure meant he was now a victim of crush syndrome. Whenever you put pressure on the muscles for a long period of time, it, it makes them so they're not able to get oxygen. And eventually they die. And when they die, they start releasing uh, acid and potassium. Which sets off a chain reaction, which builds more, and the byproduct or the end product of the chain reaction is poison. Okay, see you later. Trauma surgeon okay. Dr. Charles Richard, an expert in crush syndrome, was waiting for Darby in the emergency room at Erlanger Hospital, 15 miles away. He was worried. The problem with this, it, it's a time bomb. They get him out of the hole, the compression's released, and all of these factors are now released to the rest of the system. So when the pressure came off Darby, the real trouble began. Kick off. From the medical standpoint, you go from waiting to help to assuming the role of the monster because you want to have to bring them the news about what's about to start happening. And it was not going to be good news. Uh, no, it wasn't very good news at all. Darby was now in critical condition. He had suffered massive crush injuries on more than half of his body. The intense pressure destroyed most of the muscles below his waist, producing poisons that were about to cause multiple organ failure. I did not have a good feeling about him. When I talked to his wife, and I gave Darby less than 10% chance of surviving at that time. I just wanted him to be alive. Then uh, they said his left leg was crushed, and uh, they were going to have to take his left leg. Did he have a choice about the leg? No, man, not, he had a choice to live or die with his leg. And that, that, was, was, it. that was it. Darby's entire left leg was amputated. That was just the start of his battle to survive in the hospital's trauma unit. He would undergo more than 70 surgeries and skin grafts. He had liver damage. He had kidney failure. He had heart trouble. They thought they were going to take his other leg. For every step forward that you take, you take two steps back. He drifted in and out of consciousness for nearly three months. For Julie, it was a lonely time. She feared she would be left alone to raise the couple's one-year-old son, Preston. I'd go in to see him every day. I'd holler at him, you keep fighting, you hear me, you keep being strong. Darby did keep fighting, and by March, his astonished doctors realized he would recover. 
a recovery expected by no one who rescued him or treated him. But I felt like the hand of God had to be on him for him to have, one, beaten the odds initially where 99% or so of people die immediately. Uh, he survived, and then to survive each step of the way. But now came a different kind of struggle, maybe the toughest of all, learning to function with his amputation and injuries. Oh, we're going a minute and a half. With help from the staff at Atlanta Shepherd Center, a rehabilitation hospital, he okay. pushed himself to the limit, slowly reclaiming his life. His prognosis in the future is, is very good because just because of Darby. Just reach maybe four times one. Yeah. He's got an incredible spirit and a resolve that, that this is inspiring. It really is. Five and a half months after the accident, a celebration. Right. Friends and neighbors welcome home a living miracle. I have a lot of pain still, but just being with my wife and my little son, I makes it out worth it. I mean, being with them, you just you forget about the pain. Today, along Highway 58, there is little sign of the heroic struggle that took place on that frigid December night. But the man who lived through it will never forget what it took to face death and triumph over the odds. Every day I live, it's one day I didn't have the way I said, I don't take nothing for granted no more. <laughs>